Happy New Year, everybody. It is the 2nd of January, 2019. Fabulous New Year, McFossil University. Waking up to torsion field theory. Now, what is torsion field theory? Well, it's, a, it's, it's the magnetic fields that are set up around polarized bodies. Now, the Earth is a polarized body. It has a positive and negative pole, and it creates a field around it. So, what does that mean to us? Well, we talk about something called capacitance and inductance. And I'm going to just demonstrate to you what that is, because I have actual pictures of them. In the atomic realm, I believe, of electrons. And this is, this is very interesting because look, it, says it could be the reason why a watch placed over the Earth's North Pole slows down slightly while it speeds up at the equator. There is differences in everything reacts differently to magnetic potentials that are, are in its sphere of influence. That is the nature of every single atomic particle. I'm going to show you why I can say that with almost certainty. Okay, once again, very simply, this is a red laser light, pulsed red laser light. It goes pip, 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 pip. And there's really only a tiny little beam of electrons in the center of this. All the rest here is concussion from it crushing through the atmosphere and telling everybody, get out of my way. It's just like a jet fighter coming through. And a jet fighter is nothing more than a tiny particle. You'll see that next. Okay, capacitance is very easy to understand. Capacitance means you just fill me up like a bucket and I'll take whatever you got. Inductance is a different story. Inductance creates a reverse magnetic field because you're trying to force through something like this, which is a venturi. And that creates this enormous reverse magnetic field. You see all those back space and lines that curve this way? It's supposed to only be coming this way. That was that wave. And that is the tiny little particle beam within it. And because it's being forced into a restriction, just like the neck of a torus forces and then the, the big bulbous part of the torus is capacitance. That's what I believe has happened with electrons. And that is what's happening here. And you can see it creates this enormous reverse field. And what does that do? It excites all the electrons that are in that field. You see them, all those little white particles? I mean, I've shown this many, many times, so I'm, I'm sure you've seen it or you can easily see it in my videos. So, um, and then, of course, it, they, they reconstitute themselves after they come through the Venturi. But this is what I want to show you. This is accelerated light from that red laser, so it is accelerating. These are particles. We know they're particles because you can see them. They're concussing with each other's regions because they own regions around them and because they, this is a, just a, a magnetic explosion now, and they create all that reverse waves and creates all this ether. So. All this stuff is not understood well, and, and it's time to start understanding it. And now we're going to go into the capacitive inductive reactants within, I believe, atoms or electrons. All right, this is the torus. So these, this big bulbous area is a capacitance. That means if you push all the electrons in there, they will take them. Now, when it tries to go down through the core, that's inductance. It crushes the field, and it creates enormous reverse polarity. And, and that is what created all those reverse lines in the accelerated light that I showed, trying to force something through a restriction. You know, they, 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 what happens is it creates the magnetic resistance because you're forcing particles that want to own and keep other particles out of their regions, you're forcing them to literally touch each other. So they respond by becoming violent. And they in, in, illuminate and they glow and they heat. And they accelerate in the case of going through a restriction. Now, but they an enormous re reverse field which pulses back up to 10 times the applied voltage. So as the field collapses, it bounces back and forth. That's what I'm calling the electrons. And I'm sure it's happening you know, within the nuclear somewhere, a nucleus somehow. They, th this is what I see in an electron. That's an electron to me. That is, and then you get the spike coming out the, the, the ends of it. 
All right, I've probably shown this at least once, but you have to understand this intimately. Coming through that accelerator, they are in a highly accelerated form, all in chaos. They settle down to make these two structures at some point in time. This is the key to the whole thing. That is an electron in my mind. That is light. It came through the accelerator after being light. It went through there as light. It came out as light. It just happened to be crushed and plasmatized and driven into other frequencies and, and, and energies and accelerated. In my mind, it was accelerated. You could see it was accelerated. And then it forms these. Now, you can see a positive and a negative. If there's light, that means there's some form of energy there. If there's no light, that would indicate that there was no energy there or not certainly not the same as this. Then you have the spike here and a spike here. That can only happen in my mind because it's trying to force itself back and forth into a torus and that is the shape that you could certainly construct that as a torus all right and we'll look at that in a second all right i had a bit of an issue in my mind with the fraunhofer line absorption and emission uh, spectrum lines now if you're not familiar with this every molecule and atom and element has its own signature which is this series of lines and in one mode when it's cold it absorbs them when you try to heat it up and it absorbs that exact line so when you pass light through it of every frequency everything comes out except those lines so it has absorbed those lines when it's cold so now, when it's hot and it's emitting its own radiation, it emits only those lines. No colors here, only the colors of the lines. So they're exactly opposite. It will suck those lines in when it's absorbing in cold, and it spits them out when it's hot. And I kept thinking to myself, how could this possibly be? How could those two values be identical? What could possibly be happening? Now, they've always said, well, a photon comes down and it hits a, an electron and it bounces it from one level to the next. Now, and I've come to be, I sort of agree with that. And I've, I've always poo-pooed string theory, and I sort of now understand that string theory is, is legitimate to some degree as well. And there's a lot I don't agree with, but I'm starting to fall into line with some things. Uh, and I'm going to go and show you exactly what I have accepted and what I don't accept, but let's go from there and we'll see what happens. All right, I've been going along about these Fraunhofer lines, and I just showed you absorption emitting, they're exactly the same frequency, and why is that? Now, I came to, in my opinion, it must be resonance frequency bump. In other words, I'm going to explain resonance frequency and the distance of the wave from the core determines its value and its its color so here we have the nuclear core that's where your protons and, and electrons are now i say there is no neutrons and that's i'm almost certain of that there is no neutrons wherever there was neutron mass before consider that electron mass and the electron mass will exceed the neutron mass in the core just past a point of neutrality and then it will the more incoming electrons will suspend themselves in cores around the nucleus because they already have plenty of electrons here and they will repel to exact quantum distances depending upon the number of electrons that are in the core and the number of electrons that are in the core will dictate and that's the isotopes and so forth, there'll be different distances for the same number of protons. You have saw something that has uh, uh, excess neutron, I mean, um, ele electrons in the core, because they are electrons, they're not neutrons, and they continue to build a different profile around the core. So even though the core has, let's just, I'm going to throw a number out, 20 protons, it could have 50 what they used to think was neutrons, I'm calling them electrons. So the 50 electrons keeps these things right in this spot. What if it had 52 electrons? And they do sometimes and still have 50 protons. That's called an isotope. And then they might go out here, this one might go out a little further, and this one might go a little further, and this might go a little further. 
and they say, oh, it doesn't make a difference, they're too close. Well, they're very, very close, but they are not that close. To, it, makes, it does make a difference, it makes a huge difference. It is the bump effect of the wave. You have to have a wave that hits this wave at the same frequency. So, what could I do with these frequencies? You look at it, ah, it's kind of confusing. One's a little long, one's a little shorter, one's this is fast. No, that indicates the color. The blue is very fast and green is a little slower and red is, is, is the slowest. They are further distances from the nucleus. That's why they, this string now, over here, is this long. So that's the strings. This string is this long. This string is this long. And the only string or the only frequency that can interact with this out of the full spectrum of frequencies, the whole frequency color range, the only one that can interact with that is blue. The only, and, it, and I'm going to give that a value of 10. You know, these are just my own values. And then the only one that can interact with that is green. And I'm going to give that a value of 20. And I'm going to give that a value of 30 is the red. So we know that we also can assign values to these things and start to do some calculations. Because in between here, there's a whole set and there's a whole set and a whole set. And there are lines in there, but they're not the primary lines. As you're going to see, the main primary lines in the Fraunhofer are there's eight extremely significant lines, and those are the first ones that he found, Fraunhofer. And those are the ones, that, well, there's actually nine he's shown, but there's eight of them, and the last two, I believe, are a single because they're right together to HK. Now, they go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, K. And each one of those is extremely dark. There is a rule of eight in the, the atomic rule. Uh, you know, uh, they call it the octet rule, and that wants eight electrons in the most outer valence shell. And if that's complete, that is the most stable that you can get. So, taking that rule, we can go a little bit forward. All right, so just to sum it up, your nuclear core has distance distances from it are determined by the negativity of the pro of the electrons and the negativity that this forces it away and they will collect this one will keep that one away and that one will keep this one away and that'll keep away from his neighbor this way and keep it away from his neighbor that way and they collect in these elegant little orbitals now if you heat a sample the frequencies are emitted all right if you warm up a cold sample in a same sample the frequencies are absorbed all right, so we know that we're dealing with these differences. I gave them a, a, a value, and then you can start doing some calculations. Now, the different isotopes of the same element, so the same number of protons, will emit different frequencies because this will give it more push away if it has extra electrons in the core. This will be pushed away a little, just a hair more. So, because the core dictates the orbital distance and therefore the frequency absorbed. So if I had an extra electron in here, which made it a, a, an isotope with an extra one, it, this might be 11 or 10.5. And they say, well, that's close enough. No, it isn't. They, these are so exact. When this is exact, these are exact. So those particles are all the same particles, as far as I can determine. There's no just one big one, one little one, none of this. they all got to be the same particle. There's no question about that in my mind. So, And I'm calling them electrons. And they do have a positive and a negativity to them. And I'm going to show you that right now. Okay, this, this is uh, from Extreme Tech. And it just showing the Fraunhofer lines. And I told you I had a very hard time with this. Now, we're going to go into this in extreme depth. And it's extremely easy once you understand it. But you have to come to the basic understanding of resonance frequencies and the way the atom is constructed. There's a thing called the rule of eight. Now, what do you see here? All these little lines are... <clears throat> absorption or emission frequencies and they relate to all kinds of different atoms so i said well these there's eight major ones well actually there's nine major ones one two three four five six seven eight and then nine is the k and i said "Ooh, that's no good because i was looking for the rule of eight which means there's eight 
orbital electrons in the outer valence and that correspond I thought to these and I said well that doesn't work and I kept working and working twisted around doing all kinds of things and I said what a fool I am hydrogen doesn't fit into the rule of eight hydrogen is out here and this is the spectrum area for hydrogen so there's actually a rule of nine <laughs> they call it the octet rule which means that all the valence shells have to have eight in them to be full and complete and and then they're the most stable now hydrogen and helium are different they fall into a single orbital and there's a maximum of two electrons in that orbital and i believe that is this region here so from taking it from here we're going to go into the characteristics of resonance frequencies how they bash into each other this is fascinating and you're going to love this and it's easy and you, you will understand this intimately by the time i'm done and if you don't ask questions and i can help you understand because it really is simple all right again i've shown these things over and over again this is amazing resonance experiment done by brush pup and um what they're doing here is they're vibrating this plate and they're using a certain number of of cycles per second hertz and that what it does is it vibrates the salt and what it's going to do is it set up a pattern and I was watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, so I'm thinking, this is fascinating. And then I realized it sets up atomic orbitals. And the higher you go with the frequency, the more complex the orbitals become. And in between these locked-in frequencies, they will not stabilize. This is the resonance frequencies that create absorption and emission. All right. Watch what happens here. They're going to go through this frequency. All right, watch. All right, at 345, this is the pattern for helium and hydrogen. It only has one area of orbitals that's allowed. Two electrons maximum. Maybe one here, one here in helium, or just one here, 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 or here in hydrogen floating through this now so now what happens after you leave this region you go into the rule of eight now let's watch that one so now we go and go up from here from 345 and in between it, it, it will not it, it's all um, it's a mess you see it's a mess not you know and then when you hit the exact 1033 boom it locks in with the rule of eight here it goes bang look at that 1033 you see how perfect that is now what is this telling us? It said that is stability here. And that one spot is where it locks into itself. And, and outside of that, nobody's allowed. Nobody, you, you can't get a guy to come here and stay there in that fuzzy state. And then as it goes up from that one, it goes up to the next. And it'll just get more complex because more electrons come in because there's more protons. But you still have three, six, eight. But it still gets all that fuzzy. And then you count eight if you count these around, 18, 20. And then as it goes up from here, 20, 41. In between, it's no good. But now you got your eight again. And it sets up these patterns of eight. See, three, six, and eight. All the way up the line. Look at that. It locks in. Now, if it's not locked in, it won't let anybody come in here that it doesn't have this particular frequency. And that frequency apparently responds, it corresponds to the distance from the, the nucleus. And so at a certain hertz, a certain distance, that is where they're going to lock in there, and, and that's all I can see. And then what will happen is if, if another molecule is coming through here and has the same frequency as this, it doubles it and pops it out of there to admit. I, I don't know. I, I, all I can say is what I'm seeing, and, and you can see what you see, and that's the rule of eight, and the other one adds up to the rule of nine, which corresponds to all those different nine major bands in the Fraunhofer lines. Now, somebody else got you know somebody else got to do something. I can't figure this all out by myself. I'm as close as I can get. Now, I'm going to show you my little patterns here that I drew on the you know board over here. All right, you saw the the um, resonance frequencies in that salt shaking patterns that were that formed at exact different resonance frequencies, and I'm saying that that is why you get a bump. 
and here's here's my interpretation of what's going on these are all the different frequencies going up from really fast to slow which is the red and the greens in the middle the blue is the fastest no the full spectrum has them all tied together there's a zillion of these fast ones slow ones you see there's some that just barely going and some that are going like crazy well what does that mean it means that when it hits another set of waves and you get two of these interacting at the same point the same height just like this you got this whole batch coming through and you get a pile of them coming together and it lifts the electron because this is nothing more than an electron they lift each other up to your top and then it goes flying off of here I'm not sure what frequency it'll be at that point but it should be at the frequency that is the the um, resonance frequency of the molecule so whatever molecule is there the light that it, that molecule emits will be because a complete spectrum light smashed into the resonance frequency of that molecule and bumped it up and threw it off of there and that's what happens and so it's kind of wily coyote but it's the best I can do and I'm calling that the resonance bump now, when I was with my son when he was young, I, I had him on a trampoline. And I was bumping him up and down, you know, and just playing with him. And he's bouncing up maybe a foot or two in the air, and he's giggling. And, and then when he was coming back down, I pushed down and let it back up as he hit. And he went flying up in the air. I was scared to death. It was this resonance bump. What he did was as I, he was going up in the air, just like this, not high. And then he came falling back down. Well, what I did was I pushed this down. It came up and hit him as he was coming down. And the whole thing went woof. And he went flying in the air and woof, scared me half to death. So resonance frequency demonstrated in child abuse. <laughs>